Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Shaper Sessions. My name's Jake, and my name's Russ. Today, we're going to do a really fun project involving bent lamination, and in a recent project that Russ actually posted himself, yeah. the recently renamed Pond Mirror. Pond Mirror. Pond Mirror. <laughs> used to be called the Blob Mirror, but we decided Pond kind of rolls. So it just sounds nicer. Um, we're Always good to iterate. Yeah. We're also going to just kind of go over a little bit of... Uh, different types of bending uh in this case it's bent lamination but we got a there's a bunch of different types of wood bending um but first off you may have noticed our new sessions landing page looks a little different got a little bit of facelift now if you go to shapertools.com forward slash sessions you will see our charming faces mm -hmm. and <laughs> right at the top <laughs> right at the top uh, you'll also see all of your on-demand sessions anything that we've done in the past what's upcoming, um, quick bios about the people that do sessions, and yeah, really cool yeah. experience. Countdown to the next session, so you know when it's coming. Yep. Um, yeah, and you can also find that at the top of our main navigation page at shapertools.com under the Learn tab, which is where you can learn everything about Origin, Yep. including watching us here. And I believe if you can't remember the link or you can't find it there, if you follow the old link, it will still redirect you to where to find all the sessions. We got you three different ways. Exactly. We'll make sure you get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks for joining us on the new platform. Um, we've got Ted, Shaper Support, in the comments uh, watching out. So please share any questions that you have, and he'll relay those to us. Uh, and we've also got Goose on the switchboard. So if you hear us saying, hey, Goose, change the camera angle, or thanks, Goose, for that note, uh, that's Goose up at the switchboard. So. Yeah, let's talk about lamination. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I wanted to show off the, the point of today. This is the pond mirror. And we can go ahead and show the Shaper Out project since it was just, just posted. There you go. This is a project you can go on Shaper Hub and download yourself. And with the very thorough notes that Russ has taken in conjunction with this video today, I think you'll be able to make it yourself. Yeah, um, this is bent lamination in two parts with some pretty neat barbell joinery. Um, bent lamination is basically taking a bunch of strips, in this case of hardwood, and gluing them together around a form. Um, the form for this was generatively designed by a computer and then cut by me with Origin. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that today, but Let's talk about all the other fascinating ways to bend wood. Uh, we've got four different bending processes on the list for today. We've got bent lamination, kerf bending, steam bending, and you may or may not have heard about this one before, cold bending. Uh, pretty neat stuff. But let's go and show off some other bent lamination projects and objects. Right, so in the th in the theme of bent lamination, this is uh, a project that one of our colleagues, Florian Meigel, did a little cable management, but using bent lamination and very similar to today, MDF forms to kind of create this wave structure there on the left. Um, and then you probably recognize this chair, the very famous Poeng chair from IKEA, mm -hmm. a deceivingly strong lounge chair. Um, that has made its way into the homes of yeah millions. I could have made this mirror frame a lot slimmer, honestly. Like yeah. The mirror frame is deceivingly strong. I feel like I could sit on this half-inch thick mirror frame. Um, yeah. But yeah, incredible how the the chair bends and goes with your weight. I think if you search on the internet, there are many videos of IKEA's testing procedures for that chair where they just press on it with a hydraulic ram for hours I compressing and uncompressing the wood and it's still going strong yeah that design's been around for a long long time and um, it's very comfortable very popular mm -hmm. uh next kind of bending we have out in the world is kerf bending this is the process of removing kerf material removing the kerf of a blade material uh along the length of a piece of timber or plywood or wherever it is and that relieves the um, relieves the stress and allows room for you to bend into a certain shape. There's crazy amount of math that can go into this. I know there's uh, 
calculators out there in the world that will actually help you determine exactly what your curves should look like to get the kind of radius that you're looking for. Um, but I always find trial and error on this kind of thing <laughs> goes a long way. Yeah. Um, and we've got two objects up on the screen here. The one on the left is, again, from our friend and former shaper in residence, Florian Meigel. Um, and you can see on his the kerf cuts on the leg bent portions. Um, this project also has bent lamination on the bridges across the legs. Uh, so he mixed in both styles of lamination there. But where you can see the kerfs removed, that's a kerf bend. Um, and then on the right, we have Alvar Alto's famous stool number 60. And a little bit more difficult to tell on this one that it's kerf bent because the kerf on this one is actually filled in with a matching colored wood filler. Um, but these are indeed kerf bent each leg. Um, and then that's just bolted on to the circular top. All right, and probably the one, one of the more well-known types of bending is steam bending, something that's been around for centuries, Long time. <laughs> if not longer. Steam bending uh, does exactly what it sounds like. It uses the power of steam, hot steam, to basically soak into the wood. You encapsulate your, your material in a chamber filled with steam, and that relaxes all the natural fibers in the wood and allows it to be quite bendy. And a couple examples we have of that. You may yeah. have seen this one. Yeah, the uh, the one on the left is one of my favorite chairs, and I'm going to drop a little chair history on you. Um, this is the Tonette Cafe chair, or chair number 14. This chair you've seen replicas of, I'm sure, all over the place. Classic steam-bent wood frame with a cane seat. And this was actually the first mass-produced chair ever designed in 1859 by Michael Tonette, and they sold 50 million of these chairs between 1860 or so and the 1930s, and they're still going strong today. Um, it's a German company uh, with an Austrian also sibling company. Uh, they make thousands or millions of these chairs a year um, and a very well-known design. But this is the chair that basically gave chair backs to the masses. Uh, before that, you were stuck with just a stool in your house, probably. This is the, the chair of the middle class in 1800s Europe. Um, and it's made, originally it was only made with six bent wood parts. You can see that the back legs are connected. Um, and then a little while along, they added two more bent wood parts to brace that back corner. So this entire chair is only eight bent, bent wood parts and a couple of screws and a cane seat. Uh, Supremely simple. And then on the right, Jake can tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, that's our friend Philip Morley, fantastic furniture maker out in the world. Um, I believe he used Origin to make all of his bending forms for this series of chairs. And it, it, it steam bending is kind of a bit of a mind blowing process because when you look at it and you just see the grain all traveling in the same direction, it really brings across that, that really elegant uh, back there to that chair. But all of his forms are shaper built or shaper made. Mm -hmm. And pretty similar to the forms that we'll show you for, for this project. Exactly. Um, and last but not least, we've got a really cool one, cold bending. <laughs> um, and this just blew my mind yeah. when you told me about it for the first time. Um, it's a we, wild thing. Yeah, we got some of this stuff to try in the shop here, and it doesn't feel like wood. And I'll explain what they do first. Um, imagine a piece of lumber that is inserted into a hydraulic pressing machine and compressed along its length. And they compress this piece of wood by 20%. Uh, which breaks all of the lignin to cellulose bonds in the wood um, and also just outright compresses all the cellulose in the wood. So what breaking the lignin bonds means is it makes the wood incredibly flexible. Um, and then what compressing the wood means is that the wood can then stretch along the outside of a bend. Um, typically when you bend a piece of wood, the, the outside needs to stretch, the inside needs to compress, 
and the central plane, you call it the neutral plane in bending, um, doesn't actually stress, stretch or compress at all. With, with wood as it comes from the tree, <laughs> it doesn't like to stretch at all, but if you compress it, that 20%, then you have 20% to play with on that stretching side of the bend. Yeah. Um, so really crazy stuff. And yeah, here's some examples. That basically allows you to uh, pull a piece of this wood out of the box and tie it into a knot. And actually, that's one of their demos in the in the sample pack that they sent us uh, that we got. There's just a casual wooden knot in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And uh, uh, you clamp this stuff to the form or bend it freehand because yes. it's so easy to do it. And it then, does come then green. what do you do? It comes green, essentially. So you need to, whatever form you're putting it into, whatever whatever shape, you have to just let it sit. You have to let that naturally dry out, and it will hold that shape. With a little bit of spring back, possibly, but uh, for sculptural or gestural things, it is just like an, it's an incredible material that kind of blows the mind. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is green right, right out of the box, so you have to work with it as such. So, yeah. Yep. So... With the exception, though, of freehand bending, uh, cold bending wood, um, in every case, basically, you need a template to bend yes. to. And that's where Origin comes into the picture. Um, I've been working here on expanding my Origin skill set and using it as a tool to assist in the general shop environment, um, using it specifically to make the things that it's best at and using it to work with other tools in the shop. Um, I'm not gonna make bent lamination strips with Origin. I made those on the table saw, but what it's really perfect for is making these bending templates, especially ones that are curved or organic shapes. So let's show off, yeah, one half of the bending template for this mirror. Yeah. I, 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 you kind of breezed over it, but when you said gener generative design, like yeah. where this actual shape comes from and being able to cut it in half accurately and have these two parts come together. But you used, describe how what program or what math you used to generate this shape. <laughs> it's it's a little complex, but it's a, it's a programming language called processing. Um, you can basically programmatically create shapes or create algorithms to create shapes. Um, and then it just so happens that for shapes like this, um, blobs are pretty common or like organic pond-like or lake-like shapes uh, is a thing that people want. So people have coded web apps to create shapes like this. Um, and you could go to, you could search the internet for a blob generator, SVG generator, and come out with five different websites that'll make shapes similar to this. Um, and then what I did, this is, um, probably a topic that we could spend a whole day talking about, but I took that SVG into Autodesk Fusion 360, uh, which I love to work in, and that's where I made all of the templates um, and associated plans for this project. Um, I took that blob and I cut it down the middle and I planned where the joinery was gonna go and I built the, the bending templates around that and then I used our Autodesk Fusion 360 exporter to export the SVGs of the faces of these bending templates to then cut with origin on our workbench. Um, so it's a pretty involved process, um, but once you do it a couple times, you get the hang of it. I love working in Fusion 360. It makes stuff like this pretty easy. Yeah, and in the files itself that you can get on the Shaper Hub project, the holes are included, but you know, really you just ended up using a Forstner bit mm -hmm. and just deciding every single one of these holes is for a clamp and you do need a pretty fat stack of clamps to do bent lamination yeah you'll grab every single one you have in your shop um yeah if you missed it we did an instagram live on the actual bending process for this so go check that out on shaper tools instagram um but to to show quickly basically what we did we do have a few strips here yep um and this is what the raw material for this frame piece looks like. So this is all glued up. This is eight strips, eight sixteenth of an inch strips together, forming a half inch or so frame. Um, and each of these strips is one sixteenth of an inch. And so you can see how easily they bend. Um, and what I did was applied uh, DAP, weld wood, 
plastic resin glue, which is our favorite bending glue, to these strips, um, stacked them all together, and then progressively clamped them around this form, um, one clamp per hole. And I actually ended up having to, the first time I did this, had to add some holes halfway through, which those are all in the files now, but <laughs> it really takes a lot of clamps. I thought I was only gonna need like 10 or 15 clamps. So we ended up with about 20 clamps per template. Um, and so, yeah, I can only bend one at a time here at the Shaper Shop. It really uses all of our clamps. Yeah. Um, but two halves, they dry overnight, and then you're good to move on to finishing. Um, I ran these through the thickness sander to take any squeeze out off of the top and bottom and bring them to the 1.2 inch, very specific thickness um, that I designed for the barbell joinery that we're going to use. Um, and that's just so that for the files that are included on Shaper Hub, that's just so that all the spacing and your offsets are correct. But there's no real reason why this is 1.2 inches specifically, um, other than that it gives a nice uh, relief for the mirror behind the front of the frame and some space in the back for some wall hanging hardware. Yeah. Another uh, tip on kind of your glue up process, cut an extra one or two um, of your strips, cover it in packing tape, just like you did everything else on your form. Packing tape, uh, glue doesn't like to stick to packing tape very well, so it's a nice release agent. Um, but this is your outer strip that you're not going to apply any glue to. What it's going to do, it's distribute the force of your clamps a little bit better, and it's also going to help uh, stop any like dimpling happening from the clamps, because you're kind of cranking on these things pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of your, your, your barrier between that uh what else um that about covers it for the forms and bending yeah. uh we're just about to the joinery so there's two parts to the joinery um and let's show it off on the finished mirror here i can hold it up to the workstation cam goose can you see that yeah okay there we go so we've got two barbells here and then we've got negative barbells cut into each half of the frame. So half a negative barbell per side. Um, and then the other thing that we have to do is since, stay on the workstation cam here, I'm gonna bring over this bent piece. Since the portion of the bend on the, the strip on the outside has to travel actually farther than the strip on the inside, um, we get this kind of stepped feature on the end of your bent piece, your final bent piece. And so we also have to trim that to a specific length. So we're gonna cut some barbells, we're gonna trim this, and then we're also gonna cut the negative barbells on just one side of this. Um, yeah, so. so worth mentioning it. too, um, the mirror itself, we, Russ used acrylic mirror, eighth inch acrylic mirror, mm -hmm. uh, which can be cut with Origin. But a couple of tips on cutting acrylic, or most plastics, you want to use an O-flute. Just a reminder of what an O-flute is, if you want to come down there. That is a single spiral flute. Mm -hmm. Reduces friction on the plastic and gets uh, gives you a cleaner cut and reduces friction and melting, basically. So yeah, um, you can cut plastics with a two-flute bit, but if you want a better turnout, an O-flute. Yeah, I like used that. an O-flute on this and it turned out great. This was actually my first time ever cutting acrylic um, and I think it turned out awesome. Um, I also turned the spindle speed down a little bit yes. to help prevent heat buildup and rubbing and uh, and burning. So a couple of tips there. Worth mentioning the flip of the file. <laughs> yes, uh, make sure that that you have the mirror in the correct orientation um, or think through the process of what cutting and then unsticking the mirror from your workspace and assembling it into your actual part will look like. Um, this is the first mirror that I cut and this file is not symmetric um, and it's a mirror image of the frame that I had pre-built because I cut it with the mirror face down and <laughs> which is a really silly mistake. Um, so what I what I ended up doing there was then just taking the origin file, recutting it with a flip, so to make that basically non-symmetric thing face the right direction when I turned it over, um, 
what I recommend now for this project is to cut the mirror first, make the frame, and then rabbit the frame, whichever side of the frame you need to match the mirror that you have, but also think through that a little bit more than I did on this one. Uh, yeah, so. Or this way, you have book-matched mirror shapes. <laughs> book-matched right. mirror shapes. Yeah, exactly. Or they're twice as random or something like that. Yeah. Um, and quick plug, that flip feature is in our latest software update for Origin, um, Inverness. It's free for everyone, and this is one of many awesome features that's included in it, um, such as position, uh, way custom better anchor points. custom anchor points, which I actually use in this file. Um, way better pocketing, a lot of things, too many to mention even. We spent a whole session talking about it. Um, go back in at shapertools.com slash sessions to our on-demand sessions and watch more to learn more about Inverness. Um, but I would, yeah, sure. Uh, Goose is mentioning that we should bring up the page to just show it off because of how awesome it is. Uh, you can't escape Jake and Mai's wonderful smiling faces just and <laughs> Yeah, if we scroll down just a little bit, it'll say something like on-demand sessions, and not too far down there should be welcome to Inverness. Yeah, and that's with our buddy Sean, who hasn't been on sessions for a while. We should get him back on one of these. I know. I think I think he likes doing the holiday ones. Ah, uh, okay. So stay tuned. Maybe coming up in the next couple of months, we'll get Sean back on here for you. I know he's a fan favorite. Cool. So uh, we're going to cut some barbells. We're going to cut the matching joinery on the remaining side of this frame. Uh, and then we'll see how it fits. Shall we? Let's do it. Okay, cool. Um, I already have this part set up on the shelf of workstation here. Um, it's double stick taped to the shelf. I used the bar on workstation to bring that up coplanar with the top surface. Um, I'm going to scan this in a minute. I'm not going to grid this one because these barbells can be just freehand placed. Um, ideally, you want those to be going along the direction of the grain. So we're going to just place a barbell on here with the grain and it's going to come out just great. Um, one note with this material is that, and with this type of part, this part is really small, actually, and I don't think that we showed off an individual one of these. So here it is on the origin cam. This is a really tiny part, um, really delicate, and the we love our double stick tape, uh, but this part is not big enough for double stick tape to hold on its own once it's released from your stock. So what we're gonna do here, actually, is we have a piece of material that is over three quarters of an inch thick uh, and that's more than thick enough and what we're going to do is actually cut this part leave it in the stock not cut to full depth only cut to 0.625 which is approximately what you need for these joinery barbells um, and then we're going to be done with this on workstation we would then or what i did with these other parts was take that over to the bandsaw and resaw this piece of stock with the barbell pieces still attached to it and that releases your parts and then they're not bouncing around in here like with a spinning cutter which is just a recipe for getting that part chewed up yeah um, there's no way you'd get that to stick and be able to do a finish pass yeah just gives it a nice solid mm -hmm. connection to do your finish pass yep absolutely um yeah kind of similar to the onion skin method but if for even smaller parts i would just leave a bunch of material and take it to the bandsaw so yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a go. So the first step here is gonna be to scan so that we can see our material. So I'm gonna just go over here to scan, uh, bring it back a little bit so that it can see some tape. And let's do a new scan just so that we can see this piece of wood that I've got in here. So we'll start scanning. And I like to do kind of like across and down and across and down, making sure to tie a couple of rows of dominoes together. And then we've got one with the wood right there. Finish. Thanks. Okay, and now you can see this is the spindle view right here. This is the wood that we've got installed. Um, I'll just go to import, 
we've got barbell pre-programmed for an outside cut and let's get it yeah just right there looks great perfect um, so that's that's that um, we're gonna cut this is going to be with an eighth inch cutter so the first thing I always do different people have different workflows through going through this menu but the first thing I always do is the bit size and I'm gonna choose 1 8 inch don't forget to z-touch so I'm gonna move up here and z-touch spindles coming down and there we go great and we're pre-programmed for an outside cut half inch is pretty aggressive um, I'm gonna do a couple quarter inch cuts for clearing and then a smaller eighth inch cut at the bottom to take it to 0.625 I think that's gonna be my plan so let's start with a quarter inch um, and then 0.05 offset I like a little bit less so let's do a 0.03 just so we have a little less to clear up after so going down the list we got a quarter inch depth outside cut we got 0.03 inch offset we got the right bit size we z-touched and let's just double check the speeds to make sure that looks good yeah that looks good to me okay um, now we're ready to cut shall we let's do it all right Okay. I love this method for small part cutting. Uh, the relief on the bandsaw really being able to keep it secure while you're doing your finish pass. And it's worth noting too, typical rule of thumb is whatever the diameter of your cutter is should be the max depth per pass. So quarter inch cutter, quarter inch depth per pass. Um, some of the things that we do on sessions are sped up for you know, time's sake, but also if you have a fresh cutter and it feels right to do quarter inch passes with an eighth inch bit, then that's okay. But always, always test something first. Don't do something outside of your comfort zone. And we're doing rough and passes too. Using that rough offset of 0.03 is going to get us, uh, give us a little bit of leeway there. And if you don't have a bandsaw and you're still doing small part cutting, you can leave a thin skin on the bottom as well and have a similar outcome. How'd it go? Hey, great for roughing. A uh, quick pause because I want to explain that the cutting flutes on this cutter are 0 0.5 inches deep. And this part that we're going to cut is actually 0 0.625 inches deep. So I'm going to take a quick pause here. There is, um, there is some area that is non-cutting but is still that 0.125 inch diameter that is going to allow us to cut that 0.625 inches deep, but I don't want that to be in an equal width slot. So a slot that right now is exactly 0.125 inches wide. So typically what we do is go to full depth and then finish, uh, but what I'm going to do here is finish to a half inch and then go rough the last eighth inch and finish that last eighth inch. Perfect. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Thanks cool. for pointing it out. Yep. All right. Back to it. Let's see. Zero offset and a quarter inch. No, let's keep that. So worth noting that finding, especially eighth inch cutters that have a particularly long length of cut they're not very common uh, again because when you have thin uh, thin bits they tend to flex over over the length of them so they're typically not made to be very long um, so the, the bit that comes with origin the eighth inch bit that comes with origin has a cutting flute length or length of cut you might see that as LOC um, in some bit websites of half inch there are, however, some bits out there that give you a little bit longer length of cut. And I just found one, so I'll show that off in just a moment. And you see, so much of this, for this particular cut is small, fine motion. So Russ has got his, his hands planted. He's kind of using 
his pinkies as outriggers just to really get that, that gradual control of origin and those fine motions. And also a great, can great candidate for using the auto feature. We're coming through on our finishing pass now. And, you know, if you were cutting all these out, you could just stack them up right next to each other. Head over to your bandsaw and slice them right off. All right. That's pretty nice. Beautiful. Yeah, let's, uh, let's break this free. This is always the hardest part, actually. Uh -huh. There we go. Got it? Yeah. Oh, not quite. Yep, yeah, all right, got it. So, show you this on the Origin Cam, nice and crisp. Let me actually hit this with a little bit of, knock off that little burr right there. Yeah, super crisp. Um, and then when you take this to the bandsaw, it'll release super cleanly right at the bottom. Um, and that's how I cut my barbells for this really fine joinery. Um, now we need to cut the negative. Yes, we do. It's quite the setup, so you are going to have to bear with us just a little bit. What I end up doing for this, because it's a pretty large and awkward curved part, is we're going to attach the part with double-sided tape back to, um, back to its template and then we will mount the entire template using this edge as a Y reference against the two vertical alignment pins in workstation uh, and then clamp that all together um, which is really handy I don't think that I could do this <laughs> without a workstation that's no, perfect. Um, perfect for not just mounting things directly to it, but kind of second hand, like mounting templates to workstation and then using that to mount all the things that you're trying to work on. You actually still use the clamp holes too, right? Yeah, you I still use the clamp holes. I put a clamp hole right through it and then use that to clamp to the T-track in workstation, which hopefully we'll get a shot of in a second. Um, so I'm gonna mount the, I'm gonna mount the bent part to that first after I drop the, the front datum on workstation down to pop the spoil board in. Cool. So I'm gonna pop that in here. I'll just take a moment to talk about that bit that I was looking for. It's that long eighth inch bit. You don't typically see these, but you can get them and just I'll show in the origin cam just how oh how, nice how long the whole thing is. But the length of cut is quite a bit longer as well. Now the downside to this is it is quite flexible so you have to do really shallow passes as you come through because at high speeds that is deflecting ever so slightly mm -hmm. so let's let's see here the treat the the treat to this is trying to keep everything perfectly flat so i've got this double stick tape that i already installed and trimmed before the show get some things out of your way yeah here. thanks and you can get this double-sided tape on shapertools.com uh, in our accessories store. So we've got that right there. Love this stuff. And we're just going to carefully stick this right back to where it was. So we got that right there. Okay, good. The stuff is pressure sensitive. So just a good amount of pressure on that will hold it in place. We're nice and more or less flush with the workbench and I'm actually going to grid off of this bent piece so it doesn't matter if we're perfectly straight as long as we're straight enough and voila so this is going to go into workstation I've got my right hole already marked so this is going to go in the t-slot here uh, this is the tricky part that you were talking about this is the tricky part yeah so we need to get this that can just hang out right there for a second. We got to get this bar here 
so that we can get the height all set up. We've got a couple different things. We're aligned flat with the front datum. We're getting aligned with the two vertical alignment pins. And then we're also getting aligned with the alignment bar there on workstation. And that's, here's the pins right here too, if you can't see those, by the way. And that's why I love these quick one-handed T-track clamps because I don't have any more hands right now. So we've got one and then we've got another one for double security. Let's make sure we're starting that one all the way open. Okay, I think that's good. We're double check everything. So we're totally vertical and we're up against that bar support bar. Whew. Okay. Love it. Um, and last but not least, let's get, well, I'm actually going to drop this spoil board in there after I grid so that I can grid off of, I think this surface, because that's what I have set up in my shaper hub file. Perfect. So I'm going to grid off of this and then I'll drop the spoil board in, uh, and then we'll be ready to cut. So, for gridding, I am going to go ahead and swap over to the engraving bit. Um, sometimes on the show we use the cutter to do a quick and dirty grid, or it can even be a really quite good grid if you're very careful about lining up the cutting edges and making sure you're using that outer diameter of the cutter to grid with. But this joinery is so fine that I'm not trying to take any chances here. Yeah, you want your two parts to come together neat and tight. You don't want you want very limited if any seam at all. Yeah. In the welding world, we say grind it till you find it. And <laughs> I don't know if there's a sand it till you something it equivalent sand in it woodworking. Land it. Sand it till you land it. Uh don't want to sand it till you land it on this one. I want to have it line up nice and clean the first time. So, okay, um, technically we don't need to rescan, um, but I like seeing what I'm working with. Uh, you can see that in our image, we still have the image of the last piece we cut. Uh, you could still relate the digital to the physical workspace just the same by using grid and not seeing what you're cutting. Uh, but for the sake of illustration, let's do a new scan always a good thing to do a new scan just so that we get a good reality check you can also just doing. you can add to scan as well if you that too but in this case we're creating a whole new workspace so it's totally fine but you end up you end up making uh hundreds of workspaces that look exactly the same they look like your workstation um, and that's totally okay uh, but if you're working on the same project or you don't want to be able to you don't need to jump back to that old workspace you can always add to scan and get that image of the new new material. Yep. So now we can see what we're working with. I'm going to go ahead and lower just to make sure that we're only touching on the bent lamb part for the x-axis and then we're going to go because we have that kind of awkward step off um, of the bent lamination I'm actually going to probe the y-axis at a different depth on the template itself because I know that I want to cut 90 millimeters from the edge of the template and your bent parts are going to be some unknown distance. Um, it's a little bit unpredictable. So, but let's start with the x-axis. Set depth. Make sure you're using the right diameter, 0.25 inches. I also want to make sure we're using the right edge. So, here we go. It's always good when the line lines up with your image, although I always trust the grid more than the image. So in case of discrepancy. Now this is going to be a little tricky. We're going to go over here and I do want to, so what I'm going to go, what I'm doing over here, you can see this little corner. This set of steps here is my laminated part. I'm trying to grid off of this corner down here, which is my actual template. 
uh, trying to grid off of this this piece here, which is my actual template. Um, I do need to change my depth to do that because right now I'm at the depth to probe off of the laminated part. So I'm going to go in here and just lower a little more. And I hope that's long enough. I might actually have to reset this cutter. Oh no. Okay, so I do have to pull the cutter out just a little bit farther to do this. But we don't have to exit grid mode to do that. I just have to pull this out. Um, so what happened, probably a little difficult to see, is that this probe length was not quite long enough to reach the point on the template that I was trying to probe because it's a little farther down than the um, adjust it. Goose is saying adjust it on the bench cam. Are you talking about this bench cam? Okay, so this probe length was not quite long enough to probe past the bent part. Um, we need to extend it a little bit so that we can probe down to the template itself for the y-axis. So I think that's going to be sufficient. We'll just tighten that up. And it's a pretty short bit to begin with, so you're, it you're is. definitely extending it out there. I am extending it out there, and I'm trying not to clamp too hard on the collet now, actually, because it's extended pretty far. Um, and when you don't have that much cutter in the collet, then you want to be careful not to over, over tighten that. But you do want to make sure to tighten the spindle clamp every time. Yep. And now, papa. Okay, so you can see that when I move Origin toward that little corner of template that I'm aiming for, it stopped nice and firm on it. You can see it on the screen. So I'm going to hit probe three right there. It's going to retract. Perfect. That's my grid. And you can't see it because it's under the bent part in this image. But this corner is the corner of the um, of the lamination template. So that's perfect. Aligned not only to the lamination template, but also aligned perfectly to the x-axis of my bent part. So there's that. Now we swap back to the eighth inch cutter to do the actual cut. So we'll take this out here. Say so it's definitely worth switching over to the to the back of the engraving bit for this one versus just using the eighth inch cutter to probe. Yeah, a little little fiddly in there, as you could tell. So great, we've got the eighth inch cutter on here. We are going to have to do something a little bit similar to the to the barbell because this piece should be exactly a half inch thick because it's eight sixteenth inch pieces of wood, but with the glue thickness which is only a couple thousandths per um, per glue line. It adds up to about 0.55 in the other parts that I did. Um, so we're going to do roughing down to 0.5. We're going to finish all of that. And then we'll rough down to 0.55, which is only just a tiny little bit farther, and then finish all of that. But that's because we don't want there to be inter any interference with the cutter. Um, We've got a little bit of the shank that is equal diameter to the cutting flute, so we got a little extra depth to play with, um, but you have to be careful with that. So we are all scanned. We do need to import. This is the 90 millimeter joint, and this is my custom anchor on 00, zero and I just need to flip that for this side. That's under the scale tab in the menu and I'm going to flip across the Y axis and I'm going to place that right there at zero, 00. So here's our joinery. This rectangle here is to trim. Um, so I'm going to come up across to trim this nice and square and then I'm going to cut these two halves of this barbell. Um, last but not least, I am going to put in the spoil board so that I don't get any chip out on that side of the cut. It's also worth doing the trim cut first, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I decided to do the trim cut first, and that's because this is kind of like 
Well, it is a crosscut. It's not a crosscut on the table saw, but it is a crosscut. We're cutting across the grain. Um, and when you're doing a crosscut, there's always an opportunity for chip out when you exit the grain. So if we cut, if we trim first, there's only one place here where you're exiting the grain. If you do the barbells first, then there's one, two, three places where you're exiting the grain. And so that's three opportunities for chip out. Um, so we are going to trim first and then cut the barbells. All right. Take okay. it away. Okay. Cool. Let's do it. Uh, first, though, let's do our quick double check. Uh, the bit diameter is correct, but since I swapped for the engraving cutter, we did not Z-touch. So let's do that. When in doubt, Z-touch it out. Exactly. Okay. We've got bit diameter. We've got Z-touch. Um, I do want to rough this with an offset. Let's do 0.02 because it's a pretty small straight line. And then I'm also going to do this a quarter inch at a time for roughing. Okay, so we've got all of our settings. I remember the speeds are good from last time. We are ready to cut. All right, starting with that cross cut. Doing it in a couple quick passes. Worth mentioning that having your uh, spoil board in the back properly tensioned is very key for, for eliminating the chance of getting that, that chip out that he was talking about. And you can adjust that back spoil board just by those three cam screws on the top of your workstation. You're not trying to apply too much pressure, just snugging up your spoil board so that it's making contact. Got his third death pass in. Ah oh yes, the finishing pass at point at uh at half half inch depth. With a zero offset. And working his way down. I like the workaround with a uh, with a shorter length of cut cutter. You're still able to get a deeper cut. You just have to be a little bit more methodical about it. I also love this project because of the level of precision it calls for for origin. So these kind of projects are just perfect for for origin level joinery. Okay, so we can break this free and uh, that's one trimmed end. Sweet. Time for some barbells. All right, It'd back be really to really tricky it. to do that in, in, on any other tool. I mean, other than maybe a handsaw, but yeah. Yeah, it would be really tricky to do it on any other tool. Um, let's see. I think there's only so much offset that I can use for this one. Yeah, 0.01, and then you've basically got line on line. Um, and like Jake said, this is a great opportunity to use auto. I actually am going to use auto for this because it makes the circle nice and crisp. So I'm going to start on the outside here. Um, auto in, around, and out. Um, roughing down to 0.5 and then finishing and then just taking the last roughing and finishing pass at full depth. Mm. Goose suggested that I want to drop my auto speed, but I don't think that I do, Goose. I'm just going to go for it because I did a bunch of these and it felt pretty good. Uh, and we're real confident here at the Shaper <laughs> Shop. I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> we have to be when we're cutting live. We're we cutting go live. Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. What's nice about being it's being able to adjust your auto speed in all seriousness is a very key uh, key editability about Origin. Depending on the application, sometimes you want to speed your auto speed up. If you're doing engraving and text work, you may want things to move a little quicker, or you want to slow things down. 
it's nice to be able to adjust that accordingly. All right, heading down to half inch depth. The point zero one offset. Any larger of an offset and basically the line starts, the cut path starts to vanish. So finding that sweet spot is, is crucial. And that's gonna be enough too. Taking away that offset. The very fine detail work. Coming up on his last pass here shortly. Worth noting too that we're going to be test fitting these. We want to get that 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 barbell to fit just right. We want friction, and we also want to leave a little room for glue. We want this whole structure to be as strong as possible, especially once we put glass in it or or mirrored acrylic. So. We're aiming for that precision fit, which comes with test fitting. So I believe Russ is going to cut it to a zero inch offset, and we're going to see how that looks before we adjust anything from there. Fine detail work again. So much of this is in your hand positioning and just being really stable with origin, getting that fine, fine detail work. Well, it looks pretty good, but let's see how it fits. We cut it to zero? We cut it to zero. We right. cut it straight to zero. Uh, and that is, that is a little snugger. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little uh so typically we like that really tight squeaky fit here but that's just a just a little bit snugger than i would like because we want to be able to put this together and take this apart a couple times actually we're going to be using this mirror for a couple of demos in the future um yeah. so i'm going to make this one just a little bit looser but you saw that that was perfect uh and that's good enough for me so i am going to take uh just another two thousandths off of this um, and I think that's going to be, that's going to be right on. Cool. You know what? Actually, while we're doing this, I should, we did cut two things. So this one fits. Yeah. That one feels pretty good too. So yeah, we'll just do an extra two thousandths on both. Um, and again, we have to do that at two depths because there's this cutter can only cut to a half inch at a time. So we'll just do that here real quick. Um, change this offset to minus and that goes past your cut line minus 0 0.002 okay and we'll do to 0.3 and then we'll do to 0.55 on both of these all right worth noting too when you take an offset or negative offset like that like in this case 0 0.002 you're taking that off of both sides, so you're opening that whole shape up a total of four thousandths of an inch. So just consider to always double your offset when you're doing the, that kind of fit. Just something to consider. Going down to his final depth. You may, uh, oh, you heard there's some comments in the chat about changing 
that crosscut shape to a guide so that it stops at, you know, thinking that you want to select that, and that's a perfect idea. Uh, being able to change cut types like that on the fly is great. That is a great idea. Yeah, uh, then you don't have to worry about accidentally plunging on that. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, let's let's test fit this one more time. Should be just a little bit looser than before. Oh yeah, and that slides in there just perfectly. That's really nice. That's exactly what I wanted. I think typically for joinery here, we go for a little tighter fit, but that's what I wanted today. So <laughs> that's what matters is getting what you want. Exactly. Cool. Let's. Uh, we can leave this template in here. This is just double stick taped in. So let's pop this out. And Jake, since you had me assemble your last project, which was the tambour bedside table, I'm gonna have you dry fit this project, and this we'll is, see how it goes. This is a I sick did game. mark O matches with O. Okay. And it looks like I cut off the X on this side. <laughs> but well, we if we were to save this, we would mark the other X. Uh, oh, so oh cool. yeah, let's show off how good these ends look. Good idea, Goose. Thanks, dude. Yeah, check out this end. Yeah, beautiful. That yeah. is so cool. All right. Try cutting that any other way. All right. And important note, there is a small amount of spring back with this, so it might be yeah. a little sticky to install, but when we glue this all together, it, it ought to be just about perfect. And you might need the mallet for this one also. Oh, um, it wouldn't be a Sessions without that mallet. Okay. But that honestly feels really good. Pretty good. Like, yeah. That's one side. And they, it goes all the way through, too, which is cool because you can kind of balance it out. Yeah. I suppose. Do you see any benefit? I didn't do that on purpose, but it is nice that it goes all the way through. <laughs> Did um, Do you see any benefit making this a, a non-through cut on the frame itself? Like if it was... That's an interesting question. I'm not sure what the benefit of that would be. Um, I do like being able to see the joinery from the inside, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, on the back of the mirror, we cut half of that joint out with the rabbit for the mirror itself. That's true. Which is something that we ought to talk about here real quick, which is just that this mirror is assembled. How are you going to get the actual, like, or the frame is assembled? How are you going to get the actual mirror part in it? Um, we are, oh, Goose says to bench cam the assembled joint now. Okay. I'm trying not <laughs> to have to grab the mallet. No, I mean, this is this is pretty good. It's all the way through on this bottom oh, one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we can show this off assembled. And I made the, I didn't tell you this before you assembled it, but I did make the barbells slightly shorter than the width of the negative barbell. And what that, I hope, does is draws the joint together. There so that's go. why you get that real squeaky fit, even though the fit of the barbell to each side of the joint might be a little loose. So it pulls it together real nice. So you can see, um, let's see, which is, yeah, this is pretty nice. So we got, we got this right here. Can you see that? Okay, <laughs> yeah, sweet. So we've got that and that would be glued and sanded. We've got a little step right here, but there is no gap, really. You can see on the side coming back in that this pulled together super, super nicely. Um, it's a little uneven now, but obviously we would even that up in the glue up. Yep. So there we go. That's what we get doing it live. We get a bang on result. So yeah, I bet not you bad. Can't complain about that. It's pretty cool. Nice and flat too. Yeah. yeah that's thanks to the thickness sander probably and this some really care cool in glue up. Cool. And this is what you were talking about, how you can see the, you see two on the outside. Yeah, and exactly. And then one on the inside. I just think that's a really beautiful detail. Yep. And so uh, definitely cut it all the way through. Exactly. And to get that mirror to set in there, just a couple quick little details. Um, I rabbited that to a quarter inch with this rabbiting cutter from Amana Tools. This is a beefy one but this was the best one that I could find that has that quarter inch rabbit depth 
and also cut at least 0.6 inches deep, which is half of the depth of our mirror. So I wanted that to be nice all the way up to halfway. And then let's see what the best way to show off these framers points is. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah, uh, don't use this on Origin, by the way. <laughs> no, no, uh, no cutters with bearings on Origin, and also our max cutter diameter is one inch, which I think this is a good bit oversize yeah. on. So don't do it. This is for the router table. This is for the router table. 100% um, router table only. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> very quick. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, which is a cool new tool that I got to use for this project and then for many subsequent projects, is this Framers Point installation driver. Um, and what a Framers Point is, uh, if you've ever noticed the small metal tabs on the back of a picture frame, that's called a Framers Point. Um, and what that is, is it looks like a rectangle here, but there's also a triangular point that is shot perpendicularly into the frame of whatever you are working on. So I used it for this mirror. I've used it for a bunch of uh, artwork frames since then. Um, and it's really handy. It works basically just like a staple gun, but with a different piece of metal in yeah. it. And they're bendable, so they're bendable, right? So you could bend them. They make if you a wanted to swap something out. They make a bendable version and a non-bendable version, but they look identical. So I'm not sure what the difference is. Uh, anyone at Logan Framing Points who's watching this, please hit me up and tell me what the difference is. Uh, these specifically are the bendable ones, uh, but they look and feel pretty similar. I don't know. Um, but anyway, cool tool, Framing Points really cool and tool. Framing make Point that a Driver. Quick process. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, I think that about covers it, Jake. That's... What do you think? Yeah, let's show that off one more time. <whistles> Not bad. <laughs> cool. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I loved talking about this project and showing off some cool lamination techniques. Um, make a lamination project and share it on ShaperHub or go on ShaperHub and download a lamination project that we have on there. This one's on there. We've got a couple cool projects from Florian Meigel, who was our Shaper in residence for a few months over in our EU office. Um, yeah, and show us, show us what you've got. Share it with us. We always love to see it. Share it in the comments. Thanks, everyone. Until next time in two weeks. We'll see you back here, but until then, thank you very much for joining us.